Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Acts, picking it up in chapter 4 tonight. Remember, what did we learn in, in these last couple chapters? There was a man that he, he had, every day they took him, he, they laid him by the gate. Ever since he was born, he was not able to walk. But Peter, he, he went and he saw the man, he said, he said, look upon me, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And that man was healed. No, he, he was born. He was born to where he couldn't even walk. He was born lame. So, the, so there was. So people would know that he wasn't faking this. That this miracle was truly done by Almighty God. And so, and he was born that way, so the works of God could be made manifest, just as the blind man in, in the Book of John. But you see, the, the chief priests and the Sadducees they didn't like this at all. Because why? There was now five thousand people that were making up the church that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Pulling people out of their synagogues. And also the Sadducees, they didn't believe in life after death. They were very upset that they were preaching Jesus Christ in the resurrection. So what happened through the apostles in prison? But that, that's fine. You, you can handle anything that may come upon you. But then, see, people were starting to marvel at the way that they had, were speaking so boldly. And they realized, look, these people are, are ignorant men. They're not, they don't, they're not from our seminary. How do they speak with such boldness? Because the Holy Spirit was with them. And do you remember what it said? It said that nobody could speak anything against it. Why? Because this man had never walked a day in his life and he was healed. And remember, Peter said, You are healed by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Remember, Peter would say before, Why are you looking at me like I did something special? It wasn't Peter that healed, but the Holy Spirit, the, the name of Jesus Christ, that healed that man. But like I said, they, no one can say anything against it. And we mentioned how that little uh, phrase in the Greek is only mentioned one other time. And that's Luke chapter 21, verse 15. When you're delivered up before Antichrist and you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. It says, no one can gainsay nor resist it. Because it's not you that speak, it's the Holy Spirit that speaks in all languages of the world at one time. And I bring that up again because th that's what chapter 5 what it has to do with is don't lie to the Holy Spirit. And we're even given that prophecy of even the unforgivable sin. So let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for giving us a place we can teach your word. And we just ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, all right, we're picking it up in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 23. Acts, chapter 4, verse 23. And it reads, And being let go that the apostles let out of prison, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Remember, what did they say? They said, I command you not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they're going to listen? Of course not. Don't ever let yourself be compromised of the truth. People are going to mock you. People are going to hate you from teaching truth. Is that going to be too much for you? Of course not. So, but, so they, they took back telling them that. They were trying to get them not to teach the truth. Of course. And remember what Peter would say? He said, what do you think I should do? Listen to you or listen to Almighty God? So let's go to another verse. Verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Remember, that means with one mind. And said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. I mean, God created everything. He took nothing and it created everything. So like I said, Peter said, who should we listen to? The, a man that was created? Or should we listen to the creator? Verse 25. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine of vain things? That word imagining, that's what they care about or that's what they meditate on. And uh, the, the word uh, vain, it means empty or worthless. They just The things they care about, the things they think upon, is worthless things. And the heathen, you, you can really, that word you, oftentimes it's translated as nations, but here I think it's really referring to those that those who are against God, the non-believers, that's what a heathen is talking about here. Verse 26. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. I mean, they hate God. 
And you know, in Revelation chapter 19, that, that's the return of Jesus Christ, the second advent. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 19, when they see Jesus Christ descending, coming to the earth, the kings of the earth and, and the false Christ, Satan, and, and the, the fallen angels, they all gather together, and once again, they, they counsel together and to, to try to fight Jesus Christ. I mean, even to the last second, when they see Christ returning, they gather around trying to find a way to, to defeat them. Of course, that would never happen even for one second. But they said, by the mouth of David, when, when was this spoken of? It's Psalm chapter 2. And I want to go there and read it. You know, it's interesting. About half of the Psalms are, are accredited specifically to David. But you're going to see in, in Psalms 2 that there is no superscription. It doesn't say a Psalm of David. But we do learn from that Acts, from that Acts chapter 4, that this Psalms 2 is in fact written by David. So let's read it. Psalms 2 verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain things, only thinking about worthlessness, those non-believers, the ones that are against God. <clears throat> Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, of course, the anointed is Jesus Christ, like we just read in the book of Acts. Do you know what the very name Christ is in the Greek? It's Christos. It means the anointed one. So they, they and remember, they, they, they're not taking counsel of Almighty God. But they're just taking counsel of each other, trying to learn all these things that are worthless and vain and empty. Remember Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Cursed be the man that trusts in man and maketh flesh his arm. That's exactly what they're doing, trusting in each other instead of the Creator. Verse 3, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now who is there? We just read it in verse, in verse 2. Almighty God and the Anointed One, Jesus Christ. I mean, they don't want to have anything to do with God. They hate God. Anytime you maybe mention truth, I mean, they, they scoff at it. They mock it. Why? Because deep down there, they're afraid of true Christianity. They're afraid of truth. Like we mentioned before, the non-believers, they don't ever mock any other religion. They're just fine with that. But true, but Christianity, which is not a religion, but reality, I mean, they're afraid of it. So what do they do? That They mock it, call you names, call, call you evil. And so they don't want anything to do with God. And we see it today. Many rulers in this country and many others, they try to take God away from everything. So that they are sure going to pay for that. Verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And you know that part, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. It says basically the same thing in Psalm chapter 37 verse 13. That acrostic psalm where it says, "Don't worry if it seems like the wicked are going to get ahead, or if it seems like the wicked are the wicked people are the ones who are blessed. Just be patient. Wait on the Lord. They're going to consume into smoke forever and ever. And you're going to be the one to see it." But verse thirteen, it does say that the Lord will laugh at them. But the, really, the key in this is that word derision. You know, you know what that means in the in the Hebrew? It means it means to mock. I mean, it means to, to, to laugh at, but it means to speak intelligent or to speak unintelligibly. And what that's saying is that when the truth of God's word is spoken, they cannot understand it. They can't understand truth. They don't have the Holy Spirit. So when the true word of God is being taught, it's like a foreign language to them. That's what it means that he will have them in derision because they hate God. They don't want to learn truth. Verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. That, word, that little phrase, sore displeasure, means his burning anger. And they're sure going to understand his wrath when it comes. And that, that, that word vex, it means they're going to be suddenly alarmed. I mean, at the second advent, when Christ returns, first of all, almost the whole world's going to be deceived by the false Christ who arrives first. And then when the true Messiah arrives at the seventh trumpet, they're suddenly alarmed because they because they had been deceived into worshiping this false god, this one who performed miracles and brought world peace. But there was no peace because it was the false peace under Satan. Verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, that king of kings and lord of lords. And it, it, like, like he said, in his sore displeasure, that burning anger. I mean, after God, he traded our very souls. We wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for him. Not only, not only did he do that, not only does he love us, 
But he loved us. He loves us so much. He came in the flesh as the Son and suffered and died on the cross and resurrected. But you still have people that mock God, that hate God, and what a disgrace. Because they're just so simple-minded. They only think about vain and worthless things. They can't realize Almighty God loves them so much that even the people who hate God, even the people who mock God, even, even they will have a chance at salvation in the millennium. No matter what wicked things they've done, they're going to have that opportunity at salvation. And that's why it will only be the most wicked of the wicked, those who are pure evil, that are cast into the lake of fire, which is not happening to the end of the millennium. Only those who follow Satan after they were taught face to face by the Lord Jesus Christ in a spiritual body. Those are the only people who are going to hell. Only those who are pure evil will be blotted out. Verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And this would be quoted in Acts chapter 13, verse 33, as well as uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. The only begotten, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Christ in the flesh is God himself. And he, he in a spiritual body today, is God sitting right there on the right hand of the throne. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Now here is a place where it should have been translated nations. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Once again, he's king of kings and lord of lords. The king of all. Verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And how is he going to do that? He's going to put them to shame. Because that they're going to be spiritually dead throughout that thousand year teaching period which begins when Christ returns. That's how they're dashed into pieces with a, with a, like a piece of pottery. Just broken, they're shattered into pieces. Not physically, but with shame. And I mentioned Revelation chapter 19. That's where that says that Jesus Christ, He comes to rule with a rod of iron. That word of iron being used for, because it, His authority cannot be bent. But it's that pure justice righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that verse is also quoted in Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. Verse 10. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Before it's too late, come into truth in the love of Jesus Christ. 11. Serve the Lord with fear. That means with, um, with reverence, with love. And rejoice with trembling. With, with excitement. I mean, we can't wait for the return of Christ. We can't wait for judgment day. Wrath to the wicked, rewards to the righteous. Verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and he perish from the way. What does that word kiss mean? It means to cling to. It means to delight in. It means to submit to. That's what we do to the Lord Jesus Christ. We do cling to him. Because only through him do you have peace of mind. Only through him do you have eternal life. Saying, if you don't, you're going to perish. Remember 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God says, I am, I am so patient. And God's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Like I said, only the pure evil will be cast in the lake of fire. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And that word blessed could be translated as how happy are all they that put their trust in him, who confide in him, who, who go to him for refuge and not seeking something else. And uh, that word a little, it should have been translated quickly. It's not saying his, his uh, wrath is just going to be kindled a little bit. It's saying it's going to be coming upon you quickly. Where, he, Like he said, be instructed, be, get wisdom, come out of wickedness before it's too late, before you end up spiritually dead throughout the millennium. So, that, so let's go back to the book of Acts. That's what we, God wanted us to see here. To see how the heathen do rage even today, the non-believers. They try to take God out of everything. They, they just despise any time the word of God is mentioned. Any time God himself is mentioned. Once again, they don't do that in all the other religions. Because every other religion is fake. It's vain. It's emptiness. But when true Christianity, which is the word of God, is taught boldly, they can't even stand it. It's like the Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't stand it. But God warned us the heathen are going to rage. But don't worry, God protects his own. God said, touch not my anointed. He would even say, those who, it, th those who come against my little ones, God said, it's like you touch the apple of his eye. It's like you stick a finger in God's eye. Think he's not going to render wrath on them, vengeance? Of course he is. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4. Keep going. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 27. For of a truth against thy child, that word against should be about. So for a truth about thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. I mean, say they all saw it. They all saw the crucifixion. They, 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 saw, they realized that he resurrected. 28. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. The word counsel means God's purpose. And I mean, it, it's saying that it was predetermined long ago. I mean, remember Psalms chapter 22? The crucifixion given in great detail. Specific by specific. A thousand years before it ever happened. Why? Because that was God's plan to bring salvation to the world. And that, that word, that little phrase, determined before, most of the time that Greek, that Greek word is translated as predestinated. Just like in Ephesians chapter 1 and Romans chapter 8, it says, You, God's elect, were predestinated to bring about God's plan exactly as it's written. So it was all planned out before, and it's all written. Verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. God sees it all. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Remember, and what did it say? Did it say preach some sermon that you just thought of that sounded religious? No, it said speak thy word, speak God's word. And you speak it with boldness because you know it's true. It's not some man's word, but it's the word of the living God. Verse 30. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Remember, it wasn't Peter and John that, that healed the lame man. No, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was only through His name that it was able to be done. And remember what Christ said when He sent out the apostles? He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. But remember, it's not us that has that power. It's but you do have that power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And miracles and signs are wrought. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spake the word of God with and they spake the word of God with boldness. Once again, letting us know again. You teach God's words, not your own words, and you teach it with boldness. And you know, when you do teach the word of God exactly as it's written, with boldness, it even corrects the speaker. It corrects the ones that, that teach it. But you see, if, if you're coming up on, on something that you're about to teach, and, and that, that's, that scripture convicts you, you better teach it exactly as it's written, and you better come out of that, whatever it may be, that you may have fallen into some type of sin. But you see, if you were to just to sugarcoat it or bypass it because you didn't want to come out of that sin, boy, would God's wrath be coming on down on your head hard. So when you study God's word, and when you teach it, it not only convicts those that hear it, it convicts the speaker themselves and praise God for it. Verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. And the multitude, that means every single one of them. They were of one heart and one soul because they followed the one true God, the true Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no way to eternal life except through Him. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. They, they didn't care about worldly possessions. I mean, they, they were all together. Notice it didn't say just, oh, just everybody, whether they love God, whether they work or not. No, it's all those who serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And they worked together. If, if somebody needed something, they were there to help out because they served the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't care about worldly, th worldly things. They only cared about serving God because he loves us so much. 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Now do you remember what, what that word grace means in the Greek? We studied it extensively in that book of Ephesians. It not only means the unmerited favor, but it means divine influence upon the heart. That Holy Spirit that guides you, that directs you. And when you ask for guidance, God's going to give it to you. And you don't, you don't hear his voice, but it's almost like you do hear his voice. Because he's that, he's that, just you can just feel exactly what God wants you to do. I mean, you have that guidance from the Holy Spirit, the divine influence upon the heart. And he gives it to those who love and serve him. 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. 
For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and, and brought the prices of the things that were sold. That's what they felt led to do. 35. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as, it, according as he had need. This is how God made sure that they had everything they needed because they were about to go. They were about to go out traveling, spreading the word of God. We I mean, didn't have television, didn't, didn't have radio or anything like that. The only way to, to spread the word of God is to go to that place. So God made sure that through this guidance that those who believed were guided by the Holy Spirit to make sure that they had everything that they needed. 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, and possibly this is that same one that was called Joseph in Acts chapter 1, verse 23. Maybe that, that's not a guarantee, but possible. 37. Having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid at the apostles' feet. Once again, that's what they felt led to do. Now we're going to go a little bit into chapter 5. And it's very important to know what the subject of this chapter is. It's do not lie to the Holy Spirit. Because you're going to have a lot of false preachers that like to make merchandise out of their congregation that will tell you, oh, you got to give me everything you have. Well, that's not what this is talking about at all. And it's so simple if you read it exactly as it's written instead of listening to some false prophet. So let's read it with the subject being, don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. That means they sold an estate. Verse 2. And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now the key that you have to understand, check me out in your Strong's Concordance, is this word, kept back. That little, that little phrase is one word in the Greek. Do you know what it means? It means to embezzle. It means to secretly keep for yourself through deceit. That is the sin that we're reading of right here. The sin is not that they, that, that they didn't give it all, but they had made a promise that they were going to sell their estate and they were going to give every dime that they got from that estate, they were going to give it to the apostles. They made that promise. But you see, instead of doing what they said, they decided they were going to secretly, deceitfully keep a little bit for, of it for themselves. That is the sin here. Verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? Peter knew. Why? Because he was led by the Holy Spirit. They, they, were just, they couldn't help that greed. They wanted some of it themselves, even though they had made a promise to give that all to the apostles. And remember, don't let anybody take advantage of you and rip you off by reading this chapter, because God does not send out beggars. Another thing Christ said when he sent out the apostles. He said, don't take a purse and don't take a script with you. A script is a begging bag. God does not send out people that beg for money. Because, because if they're a true teacher sent by Almighty God, God will make sure that they have what they need. Like when you read in Malachi, I said, bring the tithes into the storehouse so that the meat can be brought forth. But you see, the thing is, if you're a true teacher of God's word, you don't have to ask for it. But just like how these people were led by the Holy Spirit to even sell that land and, and bring it to the apostles, God guides and leads those by the Holy Spirit. And He will make sure that a ministry that truly teaching God's Word will always have exactly what they need and you don't ever have to ask for it. Don't let yourself be ripped off like it says in the book of Peter. Don't let those false prophets make merchandise of you. Because they love to take every, any little chance they can in God's word and try to twist, twist it so you'll give them money. Don't let yourself be ripped off. Verse 4. While well, it remained, was it not thine own? Peter saying to him, look, it was your estate. You didn't have to sell it. But that's what, they, that's what they promised they were going to do. And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? You could have did whatever you want. You didn't have to do this. Why hast thou, why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. The sin was that they promised to sell the land and give all the money. But they did it. That is the sin. And he's saying, look, now you might have thought you were just ripping men off. No, you were ripping off Almighty God. You ripped off the Lord Jesus Christ when he tried to secretly, deceitfully take a little bit for yourself, worried about worldly possessions and money other than serving the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Verse 5. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all of them that heard these things. I mean, God struck them dead right there. Killed them. And I, I will mention that little phrase, gave up the ghost, is a medical term, giving us Luke's thumbprint all over this. But since he lied to the Holy Spirit, God struck them dead right there. And I mentioned before in the beginning of the introduction about the unforgivable sin. There's only one forgivable sin, and it's impossible up to this moment that anyone has committed it. No one has committed the unforgivable sin, because it's not impossible that anyone has. But Luke chapter 12, verse 10 tells you that it is unforgivable if you're delivered up before the false Christ, and you know he's Satan, and you refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, that is unforgivable, and you will be spiritually dead. You will be cast into the lake of fire. So that's the type that we have here. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Don't deny the Holy Spirit. When it's your destiny, you were predestinated to be delivered up and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't deny it. Verse 6. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. 7. And when it, when it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And the, it's interesting, three hours, that's the amount of time that a person would be on watch. And, I mean, you got everybody else sleeping. If you're on, if you're on watch, you're responsible for those men's lives, the troops. And remember, Christ would come to Peter in one place, and, and he would say, could, could you not even watch with me one hour? Because he fell asleep. Remember, we are to be watchmen. You always stand watch. That has nothing to do with actually being awake or asleep. But you study the Word of God, you watch current events and see how they line up with the prophecy. And you sound the alarm to the people. Don't fall asleep on watch. But so, so his wife, after Ananias got struck dead three hours later, the wife comes in. Verse 8. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much, seeing if she's going to lie too. And she said, yay, for so much. She lied straight, blatantly, right to his face. Remember, she's not lying to men, really. She's lying to Almighty God Himself, lying to the Holy Spirit. What's going to happen? Verse 9. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Now it's interesting, that little phrase, agreed together, that, that, that is our, um, the Greek equates to our English word, a symphony. And what that means is they had all their ducks in a row. I mean, they, they worked real well together bringing about this deceit, this secret. And that's how the wicked are. I mean, remember, they, they take counsel together. But everything that they take counsel is worthless. But it's saying that everything they do is well planned. I mean, you don't want to underestimate the wicked. It's well planned. They had it all lined up. According together, just like a symphony, perfectly. But you see, you cannot trick Almighty God. You can't trick the Holy Spirit. Verse 10. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. God struck her dead right there. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her forth, buried, buried her by her husband. Verse 11 to complete. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. I mean, would, would, would fear come upon you if you saw two, a, a man and a woman struck dead within three hours' time? Why? Because Not because they, they just tried to rip some people off, but because they were ripping off the Holy Spirit. Like I said, don't ever let somebody rip you off. I, I, I mentioned that because a lot of, there's a lot of false preachers out there, and all they care about is money. But the sin here was that they promised that what they were going to give something, and then they tried to take a little bit of it for themselves. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And remember that the type of that this is the type of Luke chapter 12, verse 10. When you're delivered up, it's your destiny not to premeditate what you will say, but to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. For you to deny that would be the unforgivable sin. You would not even have a chance at salvation in the millennium. So yeah, you're, you're God's elect. But don't ever let that thing, oh, I, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to worry about nothing. Well, yeah, if you had that type of mindset. You're pretty much on the path to committing the unforgivable sin. So if you know truth, you stay in the Word diligently, allowing the Word to convict you, come out of your sins, and you share that Word with others. And don't ever try to deceive God, but it's impossible, because he's, He is the heart knower. He knows every thought that we have. So don't ever be so stupid to try to deceive God, because that is impossible. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your word and for giving us wisdom and understanding and to, 
to give us even the, in, the M.O. of the wicked and of our enemies so we're not deceived by them. And we thank you for giving us this building we have. We can come and teach your word exactly as it's written. We just ask you to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding, not just for ourselves, but to, so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This is recorded June the 10th, 2020 at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdom, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisk on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless.